morning, everybody. Good morning. It's JPR, and welcome back to another video. Glitches, they come in all shapes and forms. Some are harmless little bugs like Okie Dogie hopping off the screen every time it uses knockoff, and some are just downright insane. So in celebration of spooky season, let's take a look at some of the craziest glitches from every Pokemon generation. And oh geez, we have to start with Gen 1, don't we? How the heck am I gonna narrow this down to just a handful? Mew Glitch? Eh, everyone kinda knows about that one by now. Missing No? Yeah, that's old news. How about the Glitch City then? No, not the channel where all those really good Pokemon remixes come from, I'm talking about the actual Glitch City present in the Gen 1 games. This is probably one of the most impressive glitches in the game that's also surprisingly easy to access. To get to the Glitch City, you have to go to the Safari Zone in Fuchsia City and immediately try to leave when the game starts. When the staff asks if you want to leave, you answer no, and then re-enter the Safari Zone. Then you just save the game, reset, and try to leave the Safari Zone a second time. This time, the attendant will have suffered from severe amnesia due to resetting the game, and he'll instead ask if you want to start the Safari game. You then answer no again and leave through the south exit. After you've taken 500 steps outside of the Safari Zone, the PA system will still go off telling you that your time is up, and you get warped back to the Safari Zone gate. When you leave the gate a second time, you'll be in the Glitch City. A place where nearly every tile is corrupted in some fashion. The reason this happens is because you've gone outside the intended warp area and warped where you're not supposed to. Though ironically, Glitch City cannot be accessed if your 500 steps runs out inside of an actual city, as all of Kanto's cities have their own warp points. So Glitch City can only be accessed if you run out of steps on a route or some other miscellaneous area. The Glitch City will then appear as a corrupted version of whatever area you were just in when the steps ran out. Although, a lot of stuff doesn't work as intended. Trees can't be cut, signs can't be read, your Pokemon sprites will look really ugly. Oh wait, that's just regular Gen 1, never mind. But yeah, there is no singular Glitch City. There are multiple different iterations that it's possible to enter into, each with their own little quirks. Luckily, this glitch isn't permanent or harmful in the long term, as you can simply exit the Glitch City by using Fly or Teleport like any other location. Okay, Glitch Cities are impressive and all, but what about an entire Glitch Dimension? That would be the term used for this infamous Generation 2 glitch where the visuals of the entire game are affected. This glitch is performed by activating one of the many, many coin case glitches. In case you don't know, the coin case is one of the buggiest items in all of Gen 2. And you can activate all sorts of glitches just by listening to a Pokemon's cry and then using the coin case. Particularly, in this instance, you just need to listen to the cry of a Machop, a Choke, or a Machamp, and then use the coin case. The easiest way to perform this would be to go to the basement of the Goldenrod department store and talk to one of the Machoke movers. This will cause the game to reset to the title screen and confuses the game into thinking that it's operating on an original Game Boy rather than a Game Boy Color, changing the color palette of the entire game in the process. Interestingly, in Pokemon Gold only, this will turn a Ho-Oh silhouette in the title screen into a fully properly colored Ho-Oh. There are some other interesting side effects of this glitch, such as if you go to the Mystery Gift Girl in the Goldenrod Department Store, she'll tell you that you'll need a Game Boy Color to use Mystery Gift, even if you're already playing on one. It also eliminates the need for the HM Flash, as all the dark caves will be properly illuminated in the glitch dimension. The glitch may result in some oddly displayed colors here and there, and some slight performance issues whenever you try to look at your party Pokemon outside of battle. But aside from that, the glitch is largely harmless and presents a fun opportunity to play Gen 2 in a different light. Literally. Probably the most infamous bug introduced in Gen 3 would be the Bad Egg, and it's a feature that still exists to this day in Gen 9. And honestly, calling this one a glitch might not be technically correct, as it's actually an intended way for the game to handle invalid data created by cheating software. Basically, if you modify your Pokémon in a way that would cause its stats, moves, or anything else to come out as illegal, there's a chance it could turn into a Bad Egg. Unlike regular eggs, they can't be hatched, scrambled, boiled, or chucked at your neighbor's house this Halloween. If anybody asks, you didn't get the idea from me. But yeah, they're very hard to get rid of. Most games don't let you trade them, you can't release them, and just having a bad egg in your game can be dangerous. In the off chance that a bad egg does hatch, it will usually freeze your game and possibly corrupt your data. But in terms of a glitch exclusive to Gen 3, few are bigger than the berry glitch found exclusively in very early copies of Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire. Basically, 366 days after the game is first started, the in-game timer would cease to function, and certain clock-based events would no longer occur. Similar to if you had a dead battery. The glitch gets the name from the berries no longer growing around Hoenn, as those would usually be the first things you notice whenever the clock stops working. But these events aren't permanently frozen, they actually will still happen, 
another 366 days after they stopped working. This actually resulted in one of the first patches ever officially distributed for a Pokemon game. The Berry Program update, which would spring your game 366 days into the future, effectively fixing the glitch. This can be done by connecting your copy of Ruby and Sapphire to any of the other Gen 3 games, including Colosseum or XD on the GameCube. Or you could go to one of Nintendo's dedicated sites where they'd have GameCube demo discs set up distributing the patch. Players would also receive a special shiny Zigzagoon for downloading the patch. And this Zigzagoon would also be holding a Lychee Berry, the rarest item in all of Gen 3, which could only be obtained legitimately on Mirage Island. Pretty good incentive to fix your game, I guess. Gen 4 would also have a rare glitch that was actually acknowledged by Nintendo, the Surf Glitch. Present only in the Japanese versions of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, the player could surf on the door in Elite Four Eren's chamber to leave the map and enter the Mystery Zone. From there, you can access the Dark Ryan Shaman events far before they were intended to be seen. It's basically the same as using the walkthrough walls cheat from the action replay back in the day, only it was an oversight that anybody could access. Well, anybody in Japan at least. You can even surf to the end of the Pokemon League to enter the Hall of Fame without battling Cynthia or any of the other Elite Four members. The other glitch acknowledged by Nintendo during Gen 4 is the Broken Escalator glitch, where if you enter the Union Room on the second floor of the Sinnoh Pokemon League building, you'd be teleported to the inside of a wall and would not be able to return to the map. Numerous DS download stations would be set up in Japan for players to fix both of these glitches with a patch, which would simply return them to the front of their homes in Twinleaf Town, freeing them from the icy shackles of the Void. Although not exactly the same, other iterations of the Surf Glitch would return in Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, which could also be used to find Darkrai and Shaman early. Yep, faithful games, alright. Well, unfortunately, Gen 5 has nothing absolutely game-breaking. Wait, why did I just say that like it was a bad thing? Anyhow, it does have a collection of some funny oversights and errors, though. Like certain TMs being displayed as the wrong type, such as Rock Smash being displayed as a Rock-type move, and Retaliate being shown as a Dark-type TM. And while not quite game-breaking, there is a glitch that can prevent you from getting to End's Castle in Japanese copies of Black 2 and White 2. The Frozen Zoroark Glitch. This glitch is activated by following End Zoroark to the castle in Victory Road, but leaving the area in the middle pursuing it. Oddly enough, this glitch was also found in some international copies of White 2, but not in any international copies of Black 2. Gen 5 is also known for its constantly changing music, whether that be seasonal changes, mid-battle changes, or getting deeper into a dungeon. In particular, in most Unova Cave areas, the music gets slower and more dramatic the deeper you go into the dungeon. But by simply saving on the lower floor of a cave and resetting, you can change the music back to how it was on the top floor. Maybe it'll help relieve a little anxiety? You can also use Dig or an Escape Rope while you're cycling or surfing inside of any of these caves, and then travel to Pinwheel Forest or the Desert Resort to hear the music play in a slower, more distorted tune. I believe this glitched music that plays in Pinwheel Forest is not heard anywhere else in the game normally, so it's almost like accessing a secret audio file. Hello? Testing? Can you hear me? Hmm, it seems like my audio got glitched somehow. Well, if you're hearing this, you're one of the lucky few. So let me tell you that if you subscribe to this channel, you get more great Pokemon content. So make sure you do it. Generation 6 is host to another glitch that was so monumental that Nintendo had to officially address it, and this time they had to address the entire world, not just Japan. The Lumio City save glitch was an absolute killer for the first few days of Pokemon X and Y. With Lumio City being far and away the most graphically demanding area in any Pokemon game until that point, before it got dethroned by any area with grass and scarlet and violet, there was an issue where if you saved out in the main streets of the city and reopened your game, the city wouldn't be able to load in properly and you'd be permanently frozen in place, forcing you to delete your save data and start the game over. Nintendo even released an official map of places in the city where it was safe to save, officially making it the most dangerous city in the world. Not located in America. For Generation 7, it's mostly just a bunch of small visual glitches here and there that make for some funny moments. Pretty fitting for Alola, if you ask me. Perhaps one of the funniest ones is the Traitor Hao glitch. When you battle with Hao against the Aether Foundation in a multi-battle, there's a chance that Hao's Primarina can use the Z-move Hydro Vortex against your own Pokémon instead of the opponent's. My guess as to why this happens is because Sparkling Aria is the basis for the Z-move, and Sparkling Aria hits all targets in the field, including teammates. 
So there's a 1 in 3 chance that when it gets converted to a single target Z move, it will accidentally hit you and nobody else. This also means that the glitch can only happen if you chose Rowlet as your starter Pokemon. Another funny Gen 7 glitch involves Ash Greninja, where you can literally make the opponent disappear, but probably not in the way that you'd think. See, when Ash Greninja transforms, its Water Shuriken attack becomes more powerful, but it gets capped at 3 strikes, instead of the usual 2 to 5. But you can bypass this cap by using a Ditto transformed into Ash Greninja. This allows you to hit 5 times with Water Shuriken, but will also make all of the other Pokémon on the field disappear until they get hit by another move. Well, Zelda Tears of the Kingdom isn't the only Nintendo Switch game you can take to the skies. You can actually do the same thing in Pokémon Sword and Shield! How, you ask? Well, there exists a glitch where if you get behind a berry tree while riding your bike, change the date in your Switch to make the berries respawn, and then shake the tree, you can be forced out of the boundaries of the game. And using a very precise input, you can use your bike to slowly climb up into the sky. But you can also descend beneath the map using the same method. Unfortunately, you can't actually use this to get anywhere cool, but it is a pretty funny way of escaping the map. Pokemon Legends Arceus also has a rather funny glitch, where if you get hit by a wild Pokemon while attempting to climb up a cliff, you'll gain super speed. It's also possible to clone shiny Pokemon out in the wild in Arceus, and the method is quite simple. After finding a shiny Pokemon and catching it, immediately head to a cave or other sub-area on the map, wait there for 30 minutes, and then return to the same spot you originally countered the shiny in. And an exact replica of that shiny Pokemon will spawn again. Pokemon includes many unintentional cloning methods, but this has to be one of the most interesting. And boy do things come full circle, because after a few generations with relatively small, harmless glitches, Gen 9 brings them all back in full force. First of all, Scarlet and Violet also include a super speed glitch where the inputs of multiple different controllers can add to your player's running speed in handheld mode. So if you're holding up on the joystick, then connect a pro controller, and then also hold up its joystick at the same time, you can actually double your run speed. You actually run so fast the Pokémon will fail to spawn in the wild. So it's actually a really good speedrun technique in a way. Anyway, remember those bad eggs we discussed all the way back in Gen 3 that were supposed to warn people against cheating? Well, what if I told you you could get one of these bad boys legitimately in Scarlet and Violet? That's right, when the Terror Raid battles for Walking Wake and Iron Weaves were first pushed live, it was possible to update your Poke Portal to join raids for these new Pokémon without updating your game first. So you could literally do a raid battle against a bad egg and catch it. Though, you really shouldn't. Scarlet and Violet are already unstable enough as is. Even if you update the game afterward, the bad egg will not turn into either of the Paradox Pokémon, so you're pretty much stuck with it. But the game still flags it as your one and only catch for Walking Wake or Iron Leaves meaning it's impossible to get another without trading. A patch has since partially corrected this glitch, but apparently many bad eggs still remain. And lastly, one of the newest big issues in the game is that Scarlet and Violet apparently had a hard limit of 300 trainers you could fight, not related to the main story. If you did every single trainer battle in the Paldea region, that would be about 290 of the 300 trainers allowed in the game's data limit. Which means after the Teal Mask DLC came out, many people discovered that some trainers would be unbattleable preventing you from completing certain side quests like the ones involving the Ogre Clan. And with the Indigo Disc on the horizon, who knows what amusing glitches we'll see next. If you want to stay in the loop for that, make sure you subscribe, leave a like on this video, and I'll see you guys next time.